So joining me today is Dr. Terry Fulmer with the Johnny Harper Foundation, and we're going to be talking about the age-friendly health system. So welcome, Dr. Fulmer. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, Melissa. So the age-friendly health system, I heard about it a couple of years ago, and I think probably my biggest question for you is how did this idea kind of come to be, kind of the origin of it? Sure. Um, our age-friendly health systems program is something we are so excited about because we are accelerating our spread and scale in a way that we couldn't have imagined. We're now in 50 states after only two years. And it's because fundamentally people understand that they want care that is age friendly. They want care that's responsive to their needs and that speaks to them. And so this came to me as a practicing nurse. And that is that I see disjointed care. I see care where the handoffs are not what they could be. And I see us focused on disease specific conversations, which is um, not necessarily the best way to think about older people who usually have three to five chronic diseases or conditions and are managing multiple medications and have, have complexity. Okay, so this started, what, about two, three years ago? I think it started when I became nurse, a nurse in 1975, but uh, let's say that uh, when I became chairman, uh, when I became president and CEO of the John A. Hartford Foundation, the trustees asked me what I thought my uh, big contribution would be, and I said creating age-friendly health systems. So since 2015, this has been something I've been um, uh, unpacking and creating a conversation with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. Okay, so for someone who's never heard of an age-friendly health system, can I give us an idea of, of what it is? Sure. Age-friendly health systems are systems where you can count on people thinking about you and what your care needs are. So we have a set of essential elements, what we call the four M's, what matters to the older individual and their families, mentation, that's your mind and your mood, mentation, medications, and mobility. And we say to older people and their families, you should ask about the four M's and ask your, your care provider to think with, about those four M's with you. So what matters to you, why you're at the visit, what your goals of care are, and to try to be as goal concordant as you can be. Mentation, asking about your mood and, and your mind and whether anything has been changing or anything that's a problem for you. Medications, seeing particularly if you can de-prescribe, which is really important because we know that if you have multiple specialists, a pulmonologist, a cardiologist, they may not be tracking how many pills you're actually taking, and then thinking about your mobility. We have spent a lot of time thinking about falls prevention, but fundamentally we like to shift it to mobility because we know the more uh, mobile you are, the more mobile you'll stay. True. So if so a lot of what you just talked about sounded more like with a primary care visit or in like some type of clinical interaction, but this is also spreading into like more hospital settings. We, an age-friendly health system starts at your kitchen table and should end at your kitchen table. So no matter where you are in the care continuum, whether you are doing telehealth from the Adirondack Mountains, where I'm from, or whether you are on the 30th floor of your urban environment, that's where your care encounter should start and what you're thinking about. And no matter where your care journey takes you, whether it's to a primary care office, the emergency room, a rehabilitation center, a long-term care facility, you should have the four M's fundamentally following you. If you walk in a CBS Minute Clinic, um, and we're working closely with that organization, you should be expected to think about your four M's and how, uh, how much progress you're making. Our work is all evidence-based. We have the evidence. We've created it over the last 30 years of geriatrics. We know the science, and now we have to get that science implemented in a reliable and productive way. Yeah, actually, I talked about that in the overview of the podcast, that it takes 20 years from the time we discover the evidence for it to make its way into practice and how we can shorten that cycle. So it sounds like that's very much in alignment with, with this initiative. Yeah, because that's completely unacceptable. Yes. Well, I think that 
people are resistant to change and that uh, anything we can do to make it easy for people to do the right thing is a good thing. And so that's why four M's, four. Can everybody remember four things? They probably can. And so when you talk about things to make it easier for people, what are some of the resources that you've developed if someone was interested in becoming an age-friendly health system? Well, in partnership, again, with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, IHI, in Boston, Massachusetts, we have, um, we have just created an incredible wealth of content for anybody who wants to really get on the journey with age-friendly health systems. So if you go onto that website, uh, IHI.org, or backslash age friendly, you will find a set of guidelines that will tell you how to use the forums in practice, how to get a return on investment calculator that helps you show uh, the way in which you will be able to be more cost effective with this care. You'll have uh, a care guide that talks about each of the forums individually, as well as a number of additional resources. Each of our M's are measured by the clinical uh, uh, the clinician in the clinical encounter. So if you are talking about somebody's um, mentation, you're going to be doing a, a, like a UB2 brief screen, which is one to detect uh, any kind of delirium. You might use the CAM assessment. If there's evidence that a person seems to have uh, more profound changes, you might have a dementia screen. So it's all using the science that we already know, but putting it into practice in a way that is reliably done across care settings, reliably done across clinicians, so that an older person has a true sense of what's changing for them, what's improving for them, what might be uh, changing in a way that they want to correct pretty quickly. So we're, we have those resources. We're also currently underway with the American Hospital Association, and they too have an age-friendly website. And so along with Jay Bott, Marie Cleary Fishman, the AHA has uh, action communities. They've got underway right now where you can sign up, be a part of an action community with the age-friendly health system momentum, and be a part of a cohort that is making the journey to become age-friendly. We're also working with the Catholic Health Association. The Catholic Health Association sees one in five clinical encounters in the United States. And so they're, they're at large, they are um, mission-driven, and they are wonderful partners with whom we are currently working. So all those groups, and we welcome additional groups all the time. So since you started this, how many health systems and hospitals have been involved, and kind of what's your vision for where it's going to go? So the goal is 20% of health systems by 2020. We are in 2020, and we're rolling up to that by the end of the year, and we're going to make it. Uh, and then we have an even more ambitious goal by 2023 to be in 2,500 of the health systems. There are about 5,000 health systems in the United States, and we think there'll be a tipping point where everybody will want to join us. <clears throat> and so to make sure that that happens, what are some things, that, other things you've been doing to, to ensure that sure. Point. <laughs> so so we, we make it easy for people. We, um, there is not an enrollment fee. The materials are free. Everything is open source. And so to have that material at the ready so that you can go ahead, put your logo on it, adjust it to the uh, particular circumstances of your environment, that makes things easier. We provide the faculty. And so we have regular webinars and you get world-class experts like Mary Tenetti and Mark Supiano and others across the United States who are there for you uh, and uh, that's a pretty big gift. And, and so, and we also have ways that people can ask questions on an ongoing basis and get time sensitive answers. And so some of the other policy things <clears throat> that I've seen is with the geriatric workforce enhancement programs and some of that work. Um, so maybe you want to tell me a little bit about that. Sure. We were especially thrilled when the Health Resources and Services Administration, HRSA, and the GWEP program under the leadership of Joan Weiss uh, agreed to go ahead and embed the 4Ms and the age-friendly uh, mechanisms of change into the GWEP program. So Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Programs, the GWEP program, Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Programs, are there to make sure that everybody is ready for the changing demographics and that they are, um, they have the necessary 
strategies and tools at their at their ready so that they can really do the best job with their older patients. And so the GWEPs have been a tremendous asset to our work and really helped us begin to get that workforce to think about ways to use the 4Ms in their practice. We see a lot of success in the annual wellness visit, for example, for the uh, Medicare annual wellness visit. And we know the GWEPs are innovating as we speak. It's really exciting. Yeah, I've been very excited to watch the progress. Um, in fact, age-friendly, I was looking through congress.gov the other day, and there's actually age-friendly legislation. Um, in that's Congress right. Now. And that's and moved this a little bit more into the um, area agencies on aging. And so that's terrific. Now, there's, there are also, you may be aware, Melissa, there are also age-friendly cities and age-friendly communities. And what we say is you can't possibly be an age-friendly city if you don't have an age-friendly health system in it. You can't be an age-friendly community unless you have an age-friendly health system within your, your um, catchment area. And so that, that helps people really think about what we have to accomplish, and we're doing it in partnership. I just recently put a paper under review called the Age-Friendly Ecosystem, which talks about how all of those elements can roll up. Because people talk about um, their age-friendly care, their age-friendly cities, uh, we know dementia friendly is a term that's coming into parlance. So the public needs us to be clear about what the phrase means so that they can measure it and understand it in a way that they can count on it. <clears throat> so for speaking of the public and consumers, so if I were a person listen, listening to this podcast and wanted to know if I had an age friendly health system or if I was part of an age friendly city, like how would I even find out if my community was becoming age-friendly and yeah. how so, to help them. That's a great question. We have been working with WebMD. We had a, a wonderful survey that we uh, were able to engage WebMD to complete that, to conduct that survey for us, national uh, survey. And, and we asked older adults and their caregivers what they thought of age-friendly and what they thought about the four M's. And we, we learned so much from that survey. This is a consumer-facing magazine, WebMD. You'll usually find it in your doctor's office. Mm -hmm. and, um, so, and we also had a wonderful panel down at their headquarters in Hudson Yards here in New York City where we had um, Rod Hockman, who's the president of the American Hospital Association Board, Don Berwick, the founding president of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, Martha Stewart, who's an incredible champion for great care for older adults because of her experience with her mother, and Faith Mitchell, previously the president of Grant Makers in Health. Those four people did a beautiful job reflecting on what age-friendly meant to them and what they believe is right for the nation and, and for the world. Everything we do with the IHI immediately goes global, which makes it even more exciting. So. So what should older people do? They can go on WebMD and there's content about age-friendly. And basically, if you just can commit to saying to your clinical uh, provider, I'd like to talk about four M's. I'd like to talk about what matters to me today, why I'm here, and what my goals of care are. If I don't have the, if my memory's not acute enough for me to be able to do that, I want my caregiver with me to be able to do that. I want to talk about my medications and see which ones I can get off and which ones are causing me symptoms. I'd like to talk about my mobility, how to stay strong, and how to tell you that something's changing for me. And certainly, I want to be aware of my cognition and my mentation and make sure that I am vigilant with what I can do for brain health. We know AARP is doing a beautiful job on their uh, Healthy Brain Initiative, and that brain health work is really important. So and I'm just saying these four things in your clinical encounter will get you on a path to age-friendly care. All right, so I think that's great to, to kind of give that power to, if there's a caregiver listening or an older adult, to say, if you're where if you are, if they're not age-friendly yet, you can actually help them become age-friendly by just asking the four questions for yourself and being a yes. good advocate for yourself. Yes. Um, so and I think one of the things that we've talked about before too is that, you know, geriatrics has always been kind of its own kind of specialty. And I think that the goal of this age-friendly initiative is to kind of make everyone a specialist in care of older adults, including helping to educate families about what they need to know. Sure, we'll always need geriatricians who generate the knowledge and provide expert care. But 
just as everybody doesn't, you have to have a healthy heart, but you don't necessarily need a cardiologist. You have to have healthy aging, but you don't necessarily need a geriatrician. So I think helping people understand in logical sound bites why we are moving in this direction is very valuable. So I agree with you, and thank you for being with me today. Um, any Pleasure. final thoughts? Just that I think that what you're doing is terrific. I think your, your way of getting information to our greater public is something so important, and I'm just really honored to join you today. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining me today for This Is Getting Old. If you'd like to know more, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. And if you have any questions or a related topic you'd like to hear from me about, just let me know.